Hey, welcome to episode 210 of the Brigaders. Uh, the what are we? The beer, the, the, the beer, beer comics, comics and geekery. assorted geekery. Yeah, had so we used to, we were like, uh, this is an old sign, so it's not got that written on it yet, or that. I need to get that fixed. So I'm sitting, here, I'm sitting here so you can't see like that. It's <laughs> a day so. mm -hmm. um, I'm just, uh, to my right, but not as far as where I'm here, a member of the far right is Stu. Um, yeah, um, um, we're really pleased tonight to be joined by uh, Stevie White, who is a bit of a comics legend. So <laughs> I'm really excited to get him on and play there. And then we will. But um, before um, before we do that, I thought we would chat about what beers we're drinking this week. So sure. uh, what have you got? I have a a, a boundary beer. Uh, which yeah. Where did you uh, get that baby from? Um, uh, this was from a uh, bruiser. Like that um, subscription service, Bruiser Beer. Um, oh, yeah, okay. So, and they just send you boxes of different breweries' beer. So, I, I asked for a boundary box. So, it's just a box of all these craft beers uh, from Ireland. Oh, they're a great brewer. They're a great brewery. That's what I was asking. That's a beautiful can as well. Yeah. I showed a picture of it to Tom, and he says it looks like a bunch of tins of paint you've got because they all have yeah. these designs on them. So, yeah, it was eight tins of beer, uh, and it was great because I only just, uh, tried one when I was in Belfast back in January, and I thought, yeah. I need to, like, I'm going to remember that name. And then when I came back, I seen that uh, Bruiser announced that they were bringing in a couple Irish breweries, like uh, Bull House and Boundary, and I think uh, Whitewater, and... It's just like brilliant. Now I can actually get these over here in Scotland. Yeah, so that's um, that's really good. Uh, that's one of my complaints about the 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 brewing the brewery boxes or the beer fifty two numbers is that you often get beers that you're not going to, you know, sometimes you'll fall in love with a beer and not be able to access it again. So it's pretty cool that you've been able to subvert that issue yes. and get beers that get beers from that you enjoyed while you were away and stuff. Or mm -hmm. so. Um, that's really good. What, so, what um, what is it? The one that you've got? What what it kind of beer? is? A, I'm pretty sure it was an IPA, a tropical IPA, an uh, Mbongo, M Bongo. They drink it in the Congo. Oh, that's so they say. Uh, yeah, five point five percent. And I finally got around to uh, washing the fancy fierce tumbler. Got oh, this. Nice. Uh, I drove all the way to the Caledonian Craft Beer Merchant just to buy this. Oh, yeah? A couple of years ago. Just like, oh, I've got a couple of these left. And it's like, don't move. <laughs> I'm on my way. I've not been in the Caledonian Craft Beer Merchant for a couple of months, but I went through a weird period when they first opened of just buying, like, a couple of beers and then whatever, like, nice-looking tumblers they had at the time. Right. Yeah, remember, uh, well, I've, mine's is a... Mine's is a, a Beaver Town tumbler that I love that I bought from the um the Canada and Craft Beer Merchant. And then for a wee while you could get Beaver Towns everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you, could, you could get pints of Beaver Town everywhere. And we went out for like a brew good or night out, maybe just before lockdown. And mm -hmm. uh or just after lockdown. I think it was just after lockdown. And um it was like David and uh David and Andrew just acquired loads of Beaver Town glasses. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's like I didn't see I think it was just a thing on uh, Instagram, it was like a brewery, just shared like just a picture on their stories saying, Yes, we do have uh Beaver Town, but please can all the hipsters stop stealing our pint glasses? And they're just like all normal glasses, and there's like one Beaver Town glass at the back. They, they, they are nice glasses, um, they're, they are um, their half pint glasses are really nice as well. I don't know if you've seen them, they're like, Oh, no, they're like, no. They're, they're, it's the same design, but they're, they're just obviously smaller. They're shorter glasses, yeah. but they're lovely. Um, really, probably the cool. Like most pint, when you order a half pint, it comes quite thin. You know, you, you basically it's the same height as a pint glass, but thinner ish. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Beaver Town ones are, it's the same depth, but they're shorter, so they're maybe like well, literally Aye. half a pint. And then they're quite cool. They, they they feel nice to, yeah. And drinking, uh, so like talking about beer fifty two and that earlier, they um. They, I mentioned this last week. They're doing a thing with in this month. It was Northern Monk, a brewery based in Leeds, okay. yeah. and it was like every beer in the box was a collaboration. So I just grabbed two of them. 
Uh, nice. But, um, I've got a vanilla and chocolate stout, or a chocolate and vanilla stout called Chocka, and it's their collaboration with a uh, Fierce Brute Beer. Oh, aye. So that's yeah. lovely. Um, it's only 4.5%, and I was talking to this about this with a guy at work who'd, who'd, he'd, he'd, who'd acquired like a 10%, he'd acquired a 10% beer. It was like a 10% stout, and he says it was really horrible, and I was like, and I, I was like, oh, was it flavoured with anything? And he was kind of just saying that. It was just a really heavy, like a really, really heavy stout. And I was saying, like, mm. so that can be okay, but usually when they get to, like, that percentage, they tend to put something in it, like a chocolate or a vanilla or something. Just to I tried to mask take, that big boozy hit. Yeah, it can be, at like, yeah, when you get to 10%, that boozy hit can be quite uh, overwhelming. Yeah, so. I drink in, like, fuel. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah um let's say jonathan said hi hey jonathan nice to see you thanks for dropping in um everyone say hi we've got quite a lot of folk watching just now which is lovely um and hi to everyone that's watching us on twitter or x formerly x formerly twitter and uh youtube so let us know where you're watching us that'd be really cool um our guest tonight i'm really excited to bring him on so uh where is my my spiel? So uh, yeah, we're we're thrilled tonight to have a uh, Edinburgh based um, writer and artist, uh, Streth, uh, Stevie White. He's um he as a bit of a local le legend. He's been in the game for a long time, something from about two thousand nine. Uh, he has um graph he's a graphic novel of uh, J M Barry's Peter Pan. Um, he's he's worked in most of uh, the British uh, biggies, including uh, a lot of stuff with DC Thompson, including the Beano, the Dandy and Commando, and Urwell and the Bruins. And uh, I don't think we've had anyone yet, and I'm quite excited. One of my favourite comics all in like the British pantheon is Viz. So I'm really excited to talk about um, uh, with Stevie about his experiences on the Viz. It's, I'm still a subscriber. <laughs> it's a comic that I love, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about on the podcast, I think, for obvious reasons. But um, uh, yeah. Um, without further ado, um, let's bring him on and have a wee blather. So please uh, welcome Stevie White. Hello. How you doing? You're hey. right. <laughs> How's it going? Good. Um, have you uh, have you brought a beer with you, Stevie, this morning? I forgot that this evening. I'm actually, um... This morning. This <laughs> morning. <laughs> been a long Where Thursday. are you guys? <laughs> um, <laughs> I tend to actually work at nights, so um, and I, and I will be working late tonight. So I'm on. I'm afraid I'm on the orange juice. There's nothing to be. That's driving, you could say. You know. <laughs> 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 no, fair days, man. Uh, what are you working on? So are you working on anything comic related, or is it just? It's not comic related tonight. It's a private commission tonight. Um, so something. Oh, cool. Um, most of the stuff I do is for comics, but. Uh, Get the occasional other wee sort of jobs as well. Uh, and sort of a wide variety of clients and things. Just you know, as freelancers alike, we just take everything we can get. You know. I was, say, I, um, I was I was having a look at your stuff earlier, and uh, you have done bits and pieces for obviously outside of comics, haven't you? Um, I'm trying to think what I what caught my eye earlier. Uh, but you, you see, your freelance stuff is quite varied and quite. You've done bits and pieces for. Um, I look at your portfolio just now. Who? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so you've, you've outside the comics. You have done sort of relatively high profile stuff, haven't you? Just yeah, I did, did a lot of work with like Edinburgh Royal Tattoo. Uh, yeah, like was, it was a tattoo. I was there was a tattoo that caught my eye. Yeah. yeah, when I started off, like when I was sixteen, how I got into the whole business um, was basically I joined the council, Edinburgh Council, as a YTS, which only the older viewers will remember what those things are. It was basically like a government scheme where you could like join the council, um, just like as a clerical position. Um, mm -hmm. like, the handsome sum of thirty-five pounds a week, um, but they guaranteed <laughs> you a job at the end, you know. Um, and I joined, I joined the YTS and the council. I think nineteen eighty-seven, which dates mm -hmm. me. Um, but I did end up working with the graphic design group within the council. Um, yeah. So. I basically was working on all the exhibitions the council was putting on, worked for the sort of museums and galleries for the council, producing illustrations oh, wow. and drawings. So um, it was a, a really nice, I didn't go to art college or anything, so that was a nice sort of alternative training 
for me in, in the business. Yeah. You know? My first boss in the council was actually Irvin Welsh. No way, um, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. that's so good. Yeah. I was like uh, 16 at the time. And, uh, the first, my first placement in the council was in the housing training section. It was just me and Irvin and one other person. So that was wow. uh, before, obviously. I think it was at the time he was writing train spotting. So it came out not too long it. after that, you know. You uh, can see that, that, that was published early 80s. So. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> but he's true, should I say? <laughs> Fueled the man that wrote train spotting. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> That's incredible. I was going to ask you. So, um, yeah, the thing that caught my eye was your your storyboard for the uh, the the military tattoo. I'll say it's yeah, a Scottish institution. I actually got I got involved with the tattoo, um, and it's such a nice place to, to be involved with. Like, it's such an institution, especially in Edinburgh and stuff. But it's a big worldwide. So it's a big deal, you know. Biggest biggest show on earth is sort of hail it as you know. Mm. Um, but basically, I'd been working for DC. I worked for DC Thompsons for years. And um, old uh, editor DC Thompson's had been contacted by the tattoo, and they, they were putting out a book it's called The Tattoo Fox, and they were looking for some illustrations for that. And they were kind of running out of time a little bit um, yeah. for their deadlines. So I was brought in to produce some illustrations quite quickly. Um, the, the book was called The Tattoo Fox, and it was all based on a real event because the tattoo director at the time had spotted a fox up at the castle one night and uh, the story of a tattoo fox had sort of come to me yeah. and, uh, so i got a nice free pass into the castle got to see all the wee nooks and crannies that you don't normally get into and things like that and just to uh, do some wee sort of drawings and sketches and that's how i initially got involved, involved with the tattoo um and from there uh david Olfrey was the actually director of the tattoo at the time um he was very keen to use me on other things as well uh so I ended up having drawings uh, as part of the actual tattoo itself that were projected onto the castle. Um, oh, wow. so they were huge, 100 foot tall, you know, from these little drawings that I did. Um, the castles sort of plastered in them and, uh, and also sto did storyboards for, them for the tattoo for about five years. Oh, I was going to so ask really about that. Great, it, must have been, it must have been incredible just seeing your work projected. Yeah, on the I was mad. And um, the best part was, because I did some work for them, I used to get an invite to like the royal box, the fancy bit, uh, every year. You know that I did work for them. So these were like three, they were like three hundred pound a seat tickets. Yeah. You know? um, just you'd never get into them, you know. Um, but the year that I had the projections on the castle, I was actually sat next to um, the guy that narrates the tattoo. Yeah. So I was in the little box beside them. Uh, way high up, opposite, right opposite the castle, so you're not at the sides, you're at that bit that's yeah. built up at the end. You know, um, so I just stood next to her, that's Alistair Hutton. Uh, he's narrated the tattoo for like 20, 25 years or something. He wrote the Tattoo Fox books as well. Um, so it was nice, I was sat beside Alistair and watching the drawings getting projected onto the castle. And, you know, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a nice, one of those nice, these proud moments that you, you get, you know. I assume he wasn't narrating live, like you were trying to get in a word, you were trying to chat to him. And he, he narrates live, he just, he's, he's such an old hand at it, you know. Um, the funniest thing was, because you know, you get, sometimes you get the tornadoes that fly over. Yeah. Um, and it's all like timed with that military precision, you know. Um, so he was telling me, right, the tornadoes are due at, at like nine o'clock or something like that. And, you know, in come the planes, like it's deafening when you're up at the castle, you know. And he's like, oh my god, I can't believe it. They're half a second late. You know, that's how <laughs> <laughs> he's got you to, you know, because I mean? uh, that's that's that military precision, you know. Yeah, totally. that's, that's absolutely incredible. And um, when you when you we mentioned like storyboarding, was that more to do with like, did you was I, I was just kind of interested when I read that earlier, and I kind of like I, like created like what I thought that would look like in my head. Was that were you being asked to, I know, pace out the tattoo, like 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 you would storyboard a program on on the telly or? Yeah, it's be, it's quite similar to storyboarding like a movie or an advert or something like that. So you're just showing certain drawings where you'd show the movement of things and who's coming in to the show at what point and roughly what they'll be doing. Um, 
But the main thing that the storyboards for the tattoo were used for is there's so many countries involved with the tattoo, so many languages and things like that, that a drawn is just like an international language. It was a yeah, real, totally. just a real easy way for the director just to show people, you know, they'll be on next, then them, you know. Um, so not not quite used as specifically to map out what the tattoo is going to be, like you would in a film, because they'll yeah. have all that worked out kind of anyway. But this is just more to communicate it easily between all different countries and all the different people that are involved with it, you know, because it's it's a cast of like hundreds, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, with a tattoo, so it's, it's similar to doing, you know, a film project or something, but a, a little bit different. That's that's mad. Like, it's so mad. And you, you said you were working with DC Thompson at the time. Mm. You had been working with him for a couple of years. Ah, uh, yeah, I had initially worked with DC Thompson. Um, I think I started with them in two thousand and one, maybe. Um, and I worked with them for like sixteen years on the Beano and the Dandy things like that. Um, and then the uh, I mostly worked for the Dandy, but um, yeah. went out of print. Uh, I don't know if you can remember that when actually they stopped yeah, printing. Yeah, I, I lost um, a lot. Most of my work, as I say, was for the Dandy at the time. So I kind of lost a lot of work then, um, and went away did other things for a couple of years. Um, and then I was brought back to DC Thompson when they did the digital Dandy. They sort of tried to relaunch yeah. it digitally. Um, so I got, I got involved with that, but unfortunately that didn't last too long. Um, I think it only ran for about 30, 13 issues or something online. Yeah. Uh, all like animated kind of, you know, uh, slightly, mm. slightly an ambitious project. Um, but when that kind of ended, I moved over to produce some William Boom stuff. So I stayed on with yeah. them for another sort of three years, uh, the William Boom stuff. And then um, things did get a little bit, because it's one of those NDA things that you were talking about earlier that I said would come up. <laughs> <laughs> the best yeah, they didn't even ask. You just put yourself in it. Some stuff happened at DC Thompson's. Uh, and I ended up not working with DC Thompson anymore. Um, so I went to I went to Viz, I approached Viz, um, and just said, look, I've been drawn early in the brooms for DC Thompson's. The last three years and that I'd like to do some work for you guys if possible and um i think from when i contacted them it was about three days later they got straight back in touch and said yeah we've got a strip for you to draw if you'd like and it's called the brun windsors and it's kind of like going to be in the style of the brunes uh but, but it will feature the royal family you know um <laughs> I was just like, i'll take it <laughs> you know? amazing and uh, so that was about six years ago now. So we've been with for about six, seven years. But they just came up with that idea just off the cuff, just real fast. And it was uh, just what a perfect idea. You know, the royal family as the grooms, you know. Um, was it, I, 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 would, I would wonder if they had that in mind or it was a response I, to your email. I, I, I want to think I, that they've got the idea and then yeah. you've got in touch. I asked them that. I said, have you guys had that sitting waiting for somebody to draw it? You know, I mean, the right person to come along. And they were just like, no, no, we just came up with it and we got your email and that because you know, <laughs> that's just what they do. You know, those guys are just brilliant at what they do. You know, I mean, the amount of times that you get a, a one-off strip off them, it's not like a character that's going to come back and back and back. It's just just a one-off strip. It's going to be in one issue. But the idea behind it is just so good. You just think, you know, and even the name and the title, just, you know, absolute class, you know, you just think. That could just run and run and run, but they will just use them as one-offs because they can yeah. keep coming up with uh, ideas. You know, they're often, um, in my opinion, they're often some of the better the better strips in the viz where it is just like, just it's, like it's, it's, it's picked up on like the zeitgeist of that month or that, and they've just gone exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and then sometimes they're just so funny. I've got to actually stop stop drawing. You know, and just have a, have a chuckle at myself. You know, it's just like, I say, can't believe I get paid to do this. You know, it's like, uh, especially you know, with the Brune Windsors being the royal family, it's like, it's like punching up but as high as you can. You know, uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice one to do. Um, and actually, a few years ago, I got to meet one of the royals, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite. Uh, so I, I, through Peter Pan, I do work. Uh, for a place called Mowbray House in Dumfries, oh, which well. was 
got very close uh, ties to GM Barry and Peter Pan and yeah. things. He used to play in the garden when he was a kid, and he said it was his inspiration for Neverland. So I, I did a lot of work for those guys, um, and the house features in my Peter Pan book, things like that. Um, but at one point they said, we've got a royal visitor coming, and we'd like you to be there that day, and you know, because I've got artwork all over the house and stuff like that. And um, so I was like, oh, okay, you know, can't really, you know, pass up a chance like this. Maybe get a photograph of one of the royals because I'm, you know, mm. working with the Bruin Windsors and stuff. So I didn't even know which royal it was, but it turned out that it was Camilla. So <laughs> I, did, I did get to meet her. And uh, you've been talking about you've been talking smack about her for you've been talking smack about her in, in a comic for four years. <laughs> you actually drawn her like the day before. <laughs> I remember you. <laughs> And she's saying, oh, and what do you do apart from your work here and that? And I'm like, what do I say? Do I say? And I thought it was better. You pull out the portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Camilla, you know, I did I did see the photographer. I didn't say, and then I didn't actually tell her. I thought better to just, I don't end up in the Tower of London or something, you know. Um, <laughs> totally. I did see a photographer coming down for a photo of us, um, and I pulled my quickest, sort of best Prince Charles impersonation playing with my cuffs so I, doubt, I do actually have a picture of me stood beside her pulling my best prince charles Amazing. Well, that's a nice takeaway you know so. that's amazing. <laughs> and yeah. i kept my head i had, a, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I had a, a my, my, my friend uh, doug he's got a he met prince, well king charles when he was prince charles uh, when he was yeah. a young boy on the isle of man um, and, and uh, he came up to him and was like and what like what do you do here son and uh and my friend Doug was like, he had no idea what the story meant. Well, he had no idea what the question meant. He was only about eight or nine. He was like, hey, I learn, sir. <laughs> and then apparently, apparently Charles was just like, of course you learn. And was like really angry with him and then walked away. <laughs> so like, so he usually pissed off the future king. <laughs> it was quite funny because when I was working on that strip, it was obviously the Queen was still you know, alive and, and Philip. But they've kind of disappeared disappeared from the strip as they've actually you know passed away in real life i thought yeah. i didn't know if the strip was going to continue you know i've, mm, I've actually yeah. wrote to this and just said when the queen you know she's eventually she's going to pass away and that will the strip just will end with her because she was kind of like the main character you know and they were just <laughs> like no 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 so what they've done you know they just get written out which has been yeah. a nice thing so now like King Charles is the main character, you know, yeah, boy, yeah. Um, and stuff like that. So it's it keeps it relevant as well to things that are going on now, like they do. What's what's the turnaround like for the sort of working for a, a group like the Viz or the you know? I remember reading, I read Chris Donald's autobiography a couple of years ago, and uh, he often talk he talks a lot in the book. And uh, in fairness, that that book's it's maybe about 15, 20 years old now. That's that book is autobiography, but he's always he was always talking about like the total rush. Um, to get like you know, yeah. um, because they were trying to, because they were trying to do it like I think because there was a, a lot of the stuff in the visit is quite topical. So some he, yes. he wrote a wee bit about, like sometimes they would maybe finish stories on a Monday for a Friday publication. I don't yeah. know. If... Yeah, I mean, I think I normally get about maybe a couple of weeks, or something mm. advance uh, deadline, couple of weeks that to do up to two, something three pages. Um, and the pages in Viz tend to be, they're not your typical comic book pages, they're quite heavily panelled. You, know, yeah. so you can be doing like you know, 20, 20 plus panels on a page. So it's quite, uh, it's all go when you get a, a, a script done. You know, it's like, okay, head down, go. You know, because you can get two, I mean, sometimes you get a wee bit longer, you make it three weeks. The Viz comes out every five weeks, you know, so like you say, to be topical, you've got to be on. Yeah, they've got to be really on, quick. On, yeah, so. Um, yeah. unlike, unlike the Bean and the Dandy, they were there every week, so you'd only get, you know, you'd sometimes get your, and they didn't work that far in advance, so you would just yeah. get your speeches that week for the next issue, so it's all quite, you know. Um, yeah. I, I always wondered that about the Bean as well. Um, I know obviously, like, they, they, I think as time's gone on, it's become more topical in, within the books. Um, yeah. Obviously, they try, they try and respond, but obviously, with reading it as a wee boy, like, I think they never really dipped into pop culture at all, really. You know, it was... Yeah, I think... I mean, I think the the dandy did that as well just before its demise. It started introducing a lot of strips that were um, to do with the pop culture. 
and things like mm. that. And, um, mm. uh, and I don't know if that's had anything to do with its demise or anything like that, but yeah. you know, it definitely, I think it had um, Harry Hill started writing for it, things like that, and featuring yeah. clips. And I think Stephen Fry was a character in it and things like that. So it was, it was a different beast from what I would have known as a dandy as a kid, you know. Um, yeah, I, was, certainly. I, I never did any of those kind of strips. I was working on more sort of uh, heritage characters, old, old characters like Winker Watson, things like that. Um, but yeah, it, it has changed now. I mean, I've not seen a dandy or a beano, obviously not a dandy because I finished. I've not seen a beano for a long time now, you know, 10 years. So I, I really don't know what they're like anymore. Um, I... I was talking to Crana about them very briefly. I know Crana reads the Beano and talks to him quite a lot. And I think um, there was a sort of, maybe in the last couple of years, there has been like a, quite a mad upswing in quality. I think they've realised that. I, I remember I remember loving the Beano when I was really young and then dipping in, like, like picking up, like sitting in like the dentist's waiting room and picking up a copy in my yeah. 20s and being like, this is brutal. It's like, it's not very funny at all. Like, why did I think this was so funny? And I, but I, je- I think that's been recognised as a... I, th- I think one of the qualities of partic- particularly the Beano, and I, I actually preferred the Dandy when I was younger, was yeah. that they, I, didn't, I didn't ever feel like I was being spoken down to as, yeah. a, as, a, as a kid. Like, I think, I think they, re- yeah, they treated their yeah. with respect. So. And then I think they stopped that for a wee while and there was very much a... I don't know if that, I don't know if that would um, correlate with like Harry Hill taking over in some of the writing or that, but or I, I wouldn't know that, but um, yeah. just kind of felt like they definitely did just not get very good for a wee while, and then yeah, the sales. I think the sales of both comics kind of took a hit uh, for a while. And when I was when I was last at DC Thompson's on those comics, I think I mean when I left the Dandy, it was on like seventy thousand or something a week. The Beano was yeah. on like a hundred thousand, uh, and I think those. Took a real hit, you know, but I think that's a lot to do with like um, social media as well. And there's so much competition for comics, you know, like um, in its heyday, they were selling like two million copies a week because yeah. and there's nothing else for the kids to do in the same way that there is now. You know, it's like now you're competing with TikTok and video games and, you know, just yeah. a million other things, you know. So it's a, a, a tougher business now. So they would probably try and do different things to mix it up and see what's working and you know yeah. see how what affects sales and you know because it's uh it's a different ball game now everything's kind of like a different ball game you know and um yeah. and i think kids attention spans are different now as well because of all the, the social media and things like this you know people want to be grabbed quickly by something you know instant you know Absolutely. have you ever been on Certainly. TikTok like didn't like that next. You, everyone gets yeah, two seconds. Yeah, yeah. You make, you make your mind on it. Next, swipe, 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 swipe. You know, so it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a different world. God has we have this place. conversation quite a lot at my house, just about. Um, we have this quite a lot uh, at school, uh, at the school I work at, but also at home, just about how, how um, how disposable entertainment and it, just like everything else, it's it's so immediate yeah. and so like. Um, I remember uh, when when you, we were younger, like. Um, sort of turn for me the turn of the century when I got into music. Like if I if I heard a song on the radio or on the telly I liked, and it was like slightly alternative, I would have to go to Edinburgh. I'd have to get the train to Edinburgh. I'd have to yeah. find like the one as an avalanche on Coburn Street. I'd have to go in there and I would yeah. buy an album with all the money I had and the hope that the song I'd yeah. heard at one time on the radio was quite good. Whereas yeah. now it's just like you're on Spotify and you're like, oh that shit, that's not very good. Yeah. That's yeah. It. and you can yeah. just everything. You basically you've got everything You've got every bit of information on the world now in your in your pocket. You know that's like when we were kids. That's science fiction. You know that's like you know it's be, it's better than what they had in our science fiction. You know the yeah. early Star Trek. They had the little communicators. All they could do was talk to each other on them. You know it's like yeah. the most basic mobile phone in the world. Now we can do that, but we can get everything on them. You know so it's yeah. it's a lot it's a lot to compete with. You know so. Yeah, totally. so Print sales have been affected all aspects, you know, um, as a result, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, so re- recently, like, you have been, you've been working with uh, Tony over at Comic Scene, haven't you, and doing bits yeah. and pieces. You've obviously 
are in the middle of a very successful Kickstarter? Like, do you want yeah. to talk, tell us about the talks? Because that's been quite amazing to follow. This is actually, um, so this was this. Where's the camera? It's, well, I'll, it's a comic scene. Um, and this was the one, this was Comic Scene Zero that was out just a couple of months ago. Well, maybe three months ago or something now. Um, but when, basically, when lockdown happened, I, like many people, did a little lockdown, pro I started a little lockdown project. Um, so I wrote this graphic novel called Tara Togs, mm. The Silent Unicorns. And I've always been like a massive Tintin fan. And I've always yeah, totally. said to myself, one day, I'll do, I wanted to do a Tintin kind of like book, you know, um, just to hopefully maybe to get it out there and give people the sort of thrill of a Tintin book again. Because when yeah. Hergé passed away, he said he, he never wanted anyone to do anything with Tintin ever again. So there won't be any new Tintin books um, until until Tintin comes in the public domain in like 40, 50 years and a you know, million, I imagine. But um, mm. until then, that there won't be any new Tintin adventures. I think people love it so much, they want that again, you know? So I thought a nice way around that is create a new character and do something that's has a similar sort of vibe, carries on the spirit mm -hmm. of it. It's also new, you know? Um, so I came up with a little girl this time because um, there's not a lot of little girl explorers and adventurers out there. Um, most of these things are sort of guy oriented and you've got Indiana Jones and Tintin and Asterix, and it's, you know, um, mm. I think we have Lara Croft, which is not a little girl, she's more like a, you know, a woman. Um, yeah. make, make her a little girl, um, have a similar mystery type adventure, just good old fun, charming, but set in the modern world. Um, so, you know, she can go to an internet cafe, she can have a mobile phone. Um, I decided early on, though, that she would lose her mobile phone really early in the story so she couldn't just solve everything <laughs> you know it's like like say so you know a house gets like ransacked at the start of the story and they steal her phone you know so that's gone so but she does go to an internet cafe to find something out so it, it's in the modern world but you know i wanted to use our wits and, and things you know um mm -hmm. so yeah so I, I wrote the story during lo uh, lockdown and lockdown just afforded me the chance to start drawing it i thought i'm just gonna start drawing it you know um so that was me for the next like three years <laughs> i never left the house basically <laughs> so it was done in between like this commissions and things like that um and it was a, it was a lot of work to be honest um uh, i decided to draw the pages quite big so they'd be quite detailed um yeah. in that style it's it's a very specific you know, detailed and everything's accurate in that style it's called it's called lean clear it's a clear line um yeah. so not, there's no sketchy it's all very clean lines and if you're drawing a car the outline of the car has to be perfect because if the line's a little bit wonky it really shows you know so everything's got oh, yeah. you know, precision to it uh, so it, it's quite time consuming um so yeah, so it did. It took it took three years to actually draw it. Um, uh, and then it once it was hold on, I've got I've got a uh, I've prepared the uh, the thing. But here's um oh, oh yeah hold on that's their logo yeah so that's a yeah that was some of the earliest drawings over there yeah it's it's totally stunning like it's um and like you were saying earlier about that a. Uh, that style of a uh, that tint and style it was very clear yeah. from like when you look at it there's that uh, yeah it was, yeah it's a, yeah it was something you could call yeah. knockoff yeah. tinting but to me it's a homage you know yeah because <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I mean i grew up on that stuff that's what tinting is what made me want to become a comic book artist you know uh, when i discovered tinting when i was young i was just i was a goner you know for it. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. so i do work in lots of different styles um, so I just thought for this one particular book, it's a very Tintin-y kind of story. I'll just I'll just sort of go with that kind of feel for it, you know. Uh, it's, it'll suit it, you know, basically. Um, but yeah, but have you had like, you different. said about that? Obviously, the homage, like the homage. Have you had people suggest that you were trying to knock, knock? Like, have you had negativity 
or has it been quite well received? I just had, I mean, a lot yeah. of folk that love Tim Tim love mm. the look of it because I think it is giving them that vibe again, you know. And the, yeah, haven't had anything so new with that, you know, for, for a while. Um, so you know, people go, Oh, that's like Tim Tim, but they don't go, Oh, you know, it's not, it's not been in the internet, yeah. So not try to hide it, you know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. of course, you know, it's, exactly. It's, it might have like an instant easy, nostalgia you know? for some people. Exactly, yeah. I've got, I've got mm-hmm. um, here's if you can see this. Yep, this is like, the original sort of pages. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. the size of them. There's the camera. Wow. That, the pages are quite. That's one page. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's drawn over two A3 sheets. So every single page is basically an an A2 page, so it's quite quite large. Uh, yeah. Compared to, uh, if I was working for the Dandy Rubino, I would draw the whole page on one A3 sheet, so it's twice up. Uh, mm. which means there's a lot more room to get a lot more detail in and stuff, so that's what took, took all the time on it, basically, you know. But um, the, I mean, the Tintin books, they're so well drawn. They're just so good. If you're going to like yeah. try and relate it in any kind of way, you've got to put the time in. And even mm-hmm. then, it's difficult because there was a, I mean, there was a studio of artists working on those books. It wasn't just Hergé. You know, they had studio Hergé. There was colorists and you know, other yeah. artists, with backgrounds and things like that. So they were they were real team efforts. Um, so it's you know do the best you can, you know, but try, just try and catch the vibe, you know. So I, I'm not saying that I'm matching a Tintin book because those things mm-hmm. to me are on the highest pedestal, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just uh, giving it my best shot, kind of thing, you know. And I think I've got in the ballpark, you know. Mm-hmm. So, what's the um, uh, so the Kickstarter's been, ma- I mean, I'm just looking there, the Kickstarter's been massively successful. You're looking at, um, obviously, at, your target was quite considerable, the, the target was quite considerable, but um, you smashed it with 20, you know, mm-hmm. you're just just under 300% funded with like, yeah, it's, it's, it was funded. Days. It's crazy. It was funded in six hours, which was just awesome. Because you, know, you never know with these things um, mm-hmm. whether they're going to be a hit. I mean, I, I, in the last book as well, um, it was called Milk, and it was kickstarted by Shoreline of Infinity. It's not as kind of a commercially a book. It was more of an arty kind of book. And it was printed mm-hmm. previously in like 2009. I've got the rights back, and it was just sitting doing nothing. And Shoreline of Infinity came along and said, we'd like to kickstart it. Um, yeah. Like it's not such a commercial thing, um, and, and they want. I think they're trying to raise a similar amount, a couple of thousand, um, and it just made it over the line. That kind of, you know, right, so yeah. It was kind of like all through it. You're like, ah, oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the last day, I think it just went, whoa, went over like cool, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with Tara, it just it was like six hours later, it was funded. So it was just like, oh, that's amazing. Oh, that's the pressure off anyway, you know. So um, yeah, yeah. So it's still got three weeks to go, and it's way over its target. So um, that means we can print extra books and maybe do mm-hmm. extra with them, stuff like that, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good that you're able to get over really. that. It's good that you're able to get over that initial that hurdle in the early stages because that's a uh, like you say that's the um the 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 the, the fear of Kickstarters. Like you tend to yeah. have like the. Uh, you tend to have like when you launch, it's probably when you get your biggest, Absolutely. your biggest influx of, influx of pledges at the start, and then yeah. I've done I've done the one where it's like I've done a, a couple of kickstarters and thankfully they've all been funded, but they're all like you find you get that big boost and then you've you've got like maybe you tend to sag in the set. middle, don't they? they? tend to sag yeah. in the middle, and then at the end you get a wee another wee boost at the end kind of thing. Uh, typically, and I've done loads of like I've done loads of chat with folk about like I've been on podcasts. On the science of Kickstarters, and yeah. I've done, I've done like, I've done a week, I've done a month, I've done two months, and yeah. uh, but it's, it's it's the same. My experience is it's the same pattern regardless of how long your really? your, your Kickstarter. Yeah. You yeah. you know you, you get a big boost in the first couple of days, and then you get you get a smaller one towards the end when people because I think yeah. Kickstarter sends emails out to say last minute, last minute, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think that's what an important thing to do with. Kickstart, I think, is to uh, all the stuff you do before it launches. You know, you've got to do a lot of talking about it and getting people aware. So that when it does start, that's when you get that big boom, you know, mm-hmm. right, right at the start. 
I, I don't if, if you're just to say, oh, here's my Kickstarter, it's just gone live now, and you just start telling folk about it, you know. So yeah. I think it's a really important thing now in your run up to launching your Kickstarter to really, really promote it, you know, and get mm. wet people that appetites, you know, for um, yeah, for, for for a good wee while, you know, before it actually launches, you know, like at least a month mm-hmm. or so. So it's the words out kind of thing, um, but yeah, it's a different a different way of doing it now. It's like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's like publishing without a publisher kind of thing. You know, the traditional yeah. way of going with the publisher, you know. Um, and I've had a lot of experience with publishers, and um, mostly the winners with publishers are the publishers. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah, that's the big, the big controversy. That, well, it's not a big controversy, but that's like. You have people that are maybe doing like uh, independent stuff, and then you've got small, small, uh, small to medium publishing houses, and then every so often you'll get a massive big publisher that's just yeah. And uh, that's good. Um, I think Image use Kickstarter quite a lot, for example, and you know they're yeah. um they're a multi million pound organization, yeah. and you're like, what are you doing? Come on, guys. Yeah, it's, not, it's for the little guys. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, uh, and publishers take quite a big chunk, you know, just out of, you know, the pie. Um, so, you know, uh, if you're lucky enough to get an advance from a publisher, by the time the book's published and uh, all the books have sold, say, you basically have to pay back what you've made for the advance. So you basically mm-hmm. just paid yourself to do the work to, to make it, you know, um, and the publishers get them for free. Kind of thing, you know. Um, you know, or or for giving you like an interest free loan, basically, you know. Mm-hmm. But they've taken the lion's share as well on top of that, you know. So it's going the route of Kickstarter puts a little bit more power back in your hands, you know. Yeah. Um, I noticed, like you're saying, a lot of like even, you know, really famous and successful people are using them, you know. Um, Keanu uh, Reeves was the big one. Keanu yeah, Reeves was the one I remember. Did he do one today? Uh, I know Charlie did Kaufman it. funded a film of Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. He, he did being John Malkovich. He said John Malkovich in his movies, all these mm-hmm. amazing actors mm-hmm. in his movies, uh, Nicolas Cage in Adaptation. And then he went to Kickstarter to do his uh, film Anomalisa. You know, and he, he funded mm-hmm. it that way. So you've got like Hollywood people going there. Yeah. And, you know, so he's just saying, well, you know, they must know something, you know, as well. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, well, uh, what's what's next with uh, so say that's been really, really successful, um, and obviously there's a there's a lifespan to there's a lifespan to this issue that will take you probably through to the end of the year. You know, by the time it's printed and you've done cons and you've um, um, you know that sort of stuff. What's what's the next steps? Have you got have you got a future planned out for Tyratogs or? Well, we might be looking at doing little short stories. Um, this the first um, issue of Comic Scene that, that showed mm-hmm. you there. That had a little. Yeah. Uh, this actually came out before the Kickstarter started. Um, right. Tony, um, who's been brilliant with Tara, he's really had faith in her from the start, and really, mm-hmm. he's, he's worked his butt off for this Kickstarter. He's been absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. But he commissioned. Um, so he kickstarted the Comic Scene as well. And he commissioned a nine-page short story of Tara uh, in the book. Uh, so I don't know if you're aware of Greyfriars Bobby in Edinburgh. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. And uh, the new tourist attri- sort of thing of like rubbing his nose and stuff. Yeah, aye. As an old Edinburgh guy, I hate that. And uh, I've always <laughs> wanted to like, he looks silly, he's got his big gold nose now. because all the, yeah, the, aye. It looks stupid. <laughs> and it's never been the same, so... Um, yeah, Tony asked for the story, a uh, nine pager, and I thought, well, that's a could do a little thing with Grey Friars Bobby for that. Mm-hmm. So, um, the very first Tara story is a nine page thing that all revolves around Grey Friars Bobby and his nose and stuff. So, yeah, she does work for other applications and things like that. So, there might be a, a potential of doing even short stories of her here and there, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Amazing. Could possibly do another big long story with her, but for me initially it was just uh, like I say, all my books are very different. Um, first book was a sort of anthology, science fiction, fantasy. Next one was like a humor newspaper strip cartoons, three panel Garfield. Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. 
Um, yeah. After that, I did a horror, which was really extreme horror graphic novel. Um, uh, then I've done Tara Togs. So I like to sort of mix it up and do something yeah. you know, different. Yeah. But um, if the opportunity came along to another one, it was actually, you know, making some, you know, stuff coming back in from it, then absolutely. Uh, We'll just have to we'll just have to see, you know. Early days with a but a nice yeah, promising yeah. start though, you know. Yeah, I've heard from since that. Yeah. Are you doing it? Are you are you taking it out on the road? Are you gonna do the conventions and things like that? Yeah, anything I think coming up? Booked, um some conventions, so I'll we'll be hitting those and take and we'll have some copies printed up by then and stuff, you know, so if we mm -hmm. go along um uh do the tour or anything. Uh, okay. Which would be quite good because we did a lot of that with Peter Pan, um, which kind of sold yeah. itself at conventions because it was it's Peter Pan, everybody knows the name already. Yeah, so we did yeah, a, lot totally. of and, uh, a lot of visits to schools and things like that. And, and, and yeah, nice, so, so we could even do a bit of that with this one because it is mm -hmm. for ages nine to 99, kind of thing, you know. Um, yeah, aye, so that's a, so exciting opportunities. Mm -hmm. Kind of things, you know. We'll just see what happens. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's totally, totally made up for. I'm totally made up for you and how well it's been received. I'm really excited yeah, to get my copy. Yeah, no, it's been all. Um, big thanks to everybody that's you know back to the the Kickstarter or even just shared the link or yeah, it all helps. You know, all, all helps, you know. Um, yeah. Just getting the word out, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, totally, it's and uh, also we'll do our bit as well. But yeah, um, it's Thank absolutely amazing that that's come so well. Um, so normally, uh, Stevie, what we do at this sort of stage is we start to just talk nonsense about what we've been up to. So okay. it's up to you. We, we, we're gonna we give you the um we give you the opportunity to bail if you need to. Um, yeah. Would you uh, mind off if I did? Because I'm at, I'm on a deadline for some. Oh, I feel really bad. Not, I'd love to stay nah. for some nonsense. <laughs> More than welcome to you're, especially you're bow out. I should, yeah. as they say, but in this case, get back to work. Get back to the John board. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank, we'll, we'll catch up with you soon, man. We'll definitely, we'll definitely get you back on in Blether and stuff. It's been great having awesome. you. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Really enjoyed it. That's brilliant. Thanks so much. Cool. Take we'll care. Soon, Cheers. Cheers now. I could talk to Stevie for ages. Like, like as I say, genuinely, mm -hmm. like his career's incredible. When, when when I was looking at like all all this stuff he's done and. Um, we feel like we barely touched on like his career in DC Thompson, which is a uh, yeah substantial. Like he, he like when you think of DC Thompson, you think Commando, you think Be No Dandy, you think the Bruins in your will, and he's done them all. So mm -hmm. um, definitely back on in that as well. But the Viz man, the Viz is like I like I on a daily basis share this stuff. I think I shared one to the um the Brugger there was, group chat. Yeah, earlier. there's a picture. Ah, there was was one earlier. My only exposure to the viz obviously i was aware of it like the the comic covers i knew what it was and i, I was definitely at a young age i think i was either 12 or 13. i was on holiday it was my birthday and i got to open a present early and it was the viz and i was like oh no way i can't believe you are letting me read this and there's like wait let me look at it like, oh no no gordon we cannot give him this book and I never saw it again. Oh, <laughs> I was like, what? It was in my hands. You gave it to me. It's a present. It's mine. So, oh, no, no. We didn't know what it was. You can't have it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I never just saw that book book. again. <laughs> that, um, they are incredible. Uh, um, that's such an incredible uh, series. Obviously, it's got a fair bit of, like, kind of smutty, very, um, very X-rated humour. But... Um, yeah. I genuinely think the more satirical stuff, like the Broom Wizard Windsors that Stevie does, mm -hmm. and um, and the the letter page is my favourite bit. I mean, it's the bit of yeah, me and my mates. Uh, so we um we have see a, that getting shared the most. Yeah, well, me and my mate Tom, oh, my, my my mate Tom, he holds a we play backgammon quite a lot, and uh, he hosts a backgammon competition on New Year's Day every year, and uh, mm -hmm. I go around there, and there's um his mate Peter will always have. I don't know if he just gets one at Christmas, but he'll bring his vis annual that year, yeah. and he'll he'll read the letters to everybody as we're playing as we're playing <laughs> backgammon. It's like genuinely one of like the total low key highlights of my year. This is like mm -hmm. this is the nonsense. 
they say the one I sent earlier today about uh, the guy going to the Odeon and being disgusted that they wouldn't accept a fifty pound note to pay for his pick and mix, so he had to use two twenties and a ten instead. So it was yeah. um, it's genius like that all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you started a new beer? Um, uh, no, I've finished the one I've got. Um, maybe. The only thing I've noticed about the Boundary beers is they have questionable can titles. It's not the most okay. positive. Like, this fella. Don't smile. <laughs> yeah. That was that one. Then... Uh, maybe I've got rid of all the offensive ones. But just... Yeah, okay. Uh, it must be really hard to name a beer. Like, we... Um... Mm. Is, it, is it Paloma Island? Have I said that? Or Pono, um, in, yeah, I've heard of those. In they, um, they went through a wee period of naming all their beers after, with film references. And uh, I think, but I think they had to be really careful because obviously there's so many felt there's so many, like, so much red tape when it comes to referencing things. Um, and there'll be like, there'll be, there'll be bits out of movies that are trademarked. So, like, mm. and they had to be really, really, really careful. So, like, it was either them or it might have been Brewtown. They had a beer called Amity. It was obviously like a reference. It was a reference to Jaws, but right. they had to, they had to be very. I think imagine with the the specter of like Lucas Films like leaning over them. They had to in the Lucas Films uh, uh, DreamWorks looking at them. They're probably going to have to be very careful about how they um how they reference um how they reference movies. So like they can be quite obscure to the point that like you wouldn't know what actually they were referencing mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember they had a, i think it was them that had a beer and it was called like we know that you can hear us earthmen um and it was okay. the um it was the two circles from captain scarlet and i, I remember ah. i remember buying it at the time um it was the time we were, we were interviewing steve um from time bomb and obviously they just released uh they just released um spectrum the cap the new captain scarlet comic Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time we having a conversation with the boys about actually is this do you think uh, those two circles are quite icon you know as an icon iconography they're really quite um they're really quite prominent and uh, like I, I would be surprised if the Jerry Anderson company don't have some sort of ability to be like you can't you um you can't have two green circles side by side like that because <laughs> they're just bit um yeah. Because I, I know when uh, we, we we spoke to Steve from Time Bomb, he was saying like we had a conversation, a, a quite a big conversation about what he could and couldn't include in in the comic and like certain like um, the Jerry Anderson company own rights to some things but not others because they've sold them all and or they've um, right. the, BBC, the BBC hold stuff and I was like so I was actually really surprised that like a beer can would do the whole green the two green circles. <laughs> I was like, okay. um, imagine. Like you say, like it must be like to reference stuff, and it must be just. I went on a bit of a tangent there. It must be really hard to name beer cans. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, especially with something that is like, oh, I've got the great name, and then you look on Untap, it's like ah, seven other beers with the same name. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, we um, me and, me and Colin thought we had a bloody amazing name for a podcast, and then realised that there was a beer company. <laughs> 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 We're just very lucky that they. I, I emailed them right before we ever did a podcast and asked them if it was all right, and they're right. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, cheers. <laughs> I'm just going to save this email in my uh, in my inbox in my my drafts just in case. So when you change your mind, so uh, exactly. um, that's a uh, Tom saying Adam. that he's never seen a pair of headphones hang so sexily on an alpha before. Just how does Stu do it? Today I feel like I'm becoming a real man. So. This is what happens yeah. when you uh, go on YouTube. Yeah, you just get you pick any, up all any, the any random. <laughs> um, I uh, I watched your. I was ashamed to say, but I didn't watch your Belfast video until this week. But it was great. Really enjoyed really? that. And, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. glad. Yeah. It was. It, it, I'm it's really so well. glad it's 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 done well. Like I think it. It's hit like maybe 400 views now, that's and that's like the second biggest video, my biggest long form video we've had on our channel. And 
it kind of makes up for like the eight weeks of editing that I put into it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like it's always a nightmare to think, right? I spent so much time in Belfast just where we go pro, just just going around, just capturing all these shots, and then having to look at it all and think, what do you use? And you cut it all down and squeeze it into like 10 minutes, like three days into 10 minutes, and then hope people will watch it. And nine times out of 10, there's always that chance like, okay, five people watched it and it's dead. And it's never looked at again. So that's well, always so the biggest why, fear. We we often, um, we get asked quite a lot at cons, um, as you can imagine, when we're saying all oh, like, and also tonight, I'm trying to. I usually like upload our podcasts as quickly as I can onto YouTube, but it's quite mm. like you say, it's, it's quite a lot. It's not obviously nowhere near as much as the amount of editing you have to do, but it's just it's such a time consuming thing. Mm. And then you share it, and then it's you share it to put it up onto onto YouTube, and it maybe gets like ten views, um, yeah. because it, um. So we've always found that Facebook seems to be our because we've always been on Facebook. Facebook seems to be our yeah, definitely. Uh, our, yeah. Um, so I totally share that, and um, it's it's quite hard when you, and then when you what when you watch like I'll sit and watch stuff over Sunny's shoulder, and it's nonsense, and it's got like fifty million views. Oh, millions, guys, like, absolute millions! It's a it's head it's sticking out the toilet. Yeah, it's guys playing Minecraft going. I'll do this if I get ten thousand likes, and you're like. Or he's, and he gets them, and you're like, "Yeah, aye. I, I can I please get 500 followers on my channel so that we can be remotely monetized, please?" Yeah. <laughs> and, and and that's uh, it. Just you look at it's like you look at it's like these these people are selling their souls for fame, and then you think, "I wish someone was watching my channel," but um, but then you just feel like those, I don't know, like there's dignity missing between us and them. That's the problem. Yes, that's so. it. That's all that's missing. Yeah. Apart from massive swimming pools in our back garden and private islands and mm-hmm. yeah, but, uh, yeah. That's no, good. Um, I'm drinking a uh, Northern Monk Aurora, uh, which is a pale ale nice. from Northern Monk. Um, I like the can. The can's quite comic. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Just, it's nice, nice, and it's a mm. it's a mystical, romantic, and mesmerizing beer. Um, and the Northern Lights are pretty cool too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's good. It's um, as I say, really quite. I probably need to read the Ferment magazine that comes with Beer Fifty Two better. But um, I always try to. Sometimes I think the last Ferment magazine I got was your one that came with the Beer Fifty Two Scotland box, and it had like a list of bars that you should visit. So I was using that as a checklist at one point, places to go to. Was a commercial Never. on it? It might have just been in Edinburgh, but um, <laughs> so um, I do remember that was the reason I did go and look out the Fierce Bar, um, yeah. which has now become one of my favourite haunts. But um, it's, it's I, it was funny. Me and Tom were trying to uh, find beer. We were going to do like a live stream at the weekend, like ideally Easter Sunday, and we're going to drink uh, like chocolate beer, you know, and get stouts with like chocolate in it. And for some reason, there's none. I've I've hit up Sainsbury's, Aldi's, Lidl, Morrison's, and Morrison's was the only one that had two. It was like a Brew York, Chocolate Temptation, and a Coco Wonderland from a Thornton Bridge. Um, but we've reviewed those already on our channel, and then I was just looking, and I was like, no one was really doing like the gimmick, you know, when it's like Halloween beers, everyone's got their pumpkin spice out. Uh, mm-hmm. But only I think Brew York were doing a mini eggs, but calling it mini kegs, a uh, chocolate that's, stout. That's, that's yeah, that's a bit that that seems to be the only one, the only brewery I've noticed just doing the Easter gimmick. Yeah, um, I do want to try that though. Mini, a mini egg, a mini egg tinged beer sounds absolutely incredible. Mm. Did they have the Did they have the coloring on the can, like the yellow with the multicolored? Yes. Yeah, but it's, it's that all those pastel colors. They knew what they were yeah, doing. Well, yeah, they knew. Um, 
That's good. Um, I, that's an amazing wee beer, Aurora. It's um, mm. it's came in that box, but it's not a collaboration. So I wonder about what was this box? Just... Yeah. It was a beer fifty two. Sorry, it was this month's beer right, fifty two. Right. Um, okay. And yeah. I was, uh, that, that's what I was going to say. Actually, like I don't. I think in. Uh, I haven't got a ferment magazine to hand, but I think they tell you what you're going to be getting in the next month, or right, they give you okay. like a, and I, I and I just I don't check, and I, um, I actually had to go back in and change it because you can do the light beers, heavy beers, or half and half. Ah. You can choose, and I, I do half and half, but I have yeah. found that that it's definitely the lighter beers I prefer. So my my fridge has. I'm going a half too. It's yeah. always. Porters and stouts always end up being the last things in my fridge. Like, uh, I'll, I'll get to you, but I'm I, I, I always... think I had one tonight, but they're definitely not as sessionable as, like, I, I don't know if that's just our palates, but definitely mm -hmm. find like the paleo, a paleo or a Nipa or a lager are like my go tos when I want a beer. Yeah. Whereas... Ah, it's, it's almost like, yeah, I, I'd like something light to drink while something compares to my friends talking to. Mm. Like con like uh, comic creators, and then I just drink dark beer to forget. <laughs> my uh, <laughs> my dark beer thing for a while was New Japan Pro Wrestling. I don't. I'm not ashamed to tell you that. <laughs> and I don't know why that was. I, I cannot tell you why that was. But I went through a mm. period of like, if I, like I, I I watch wrestling and I drink beer quite a lot. <laughs> so I made a whole thing about I would I would if I was going to drink beer while watching New Japan Pro Wrestling, mm -hmm. it would only be a dark beer. I don't know if that was just an excuse for myself to drink more dark beer, or okay. uh, and I don't know what that was, but um, I now have it. Like I say, my like um, I've got on my Facebook every so often a picture of like because New Japan. If you watch, if you catch a live show of New Japan, it's usually about eight or nine in the morning. So it's like mm -hmm. proper, proper, like proper early you morning breakfast drinking. beers. I tell you, breakfast beer. Yeah, it's a thing. A <laughs> breakfast beer. Um, You're making it a thing. Is it um, 77? Is it 77 Brewing? No. What's that called? 71. 71 Brewing in Dundee, yeah. They have a, yeah. They have a beer They have a, bre a beer called Breakfast Toast. And it is like a... Yeah, it's, um, so that I drank that for quite a long time watching. Remember watching one summer watching the G1 Classic? Oh my <laughs> Just God, drinking so breakfast like every toast. day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. I love the G1. It's not as good as it used to be, obviously, but I think that's just one of the I've things. I've only ever like. followed it one. There was, I think there, there was one year I had enough time to kind of follow it religiously. Ever since then, it sounds like a good idea, but I can never follow it up. Yeah. It gets quite addictive because you. it's a bit like when the World Cup's on and you're watching, like, um, I'm one of those geeks during, like, a major football tournament. If they're, like, I'll buy a newspaper just so I can get, the, get the poster. Get, like the poster, right? yeah. yeah. All right, that was that was great. It's good. That was the only part I took part in. I, was like, I got the poster, I don't care about the football, but this poster's cool. <laughs> um, how's your, how's your week been in geek or geekdom? Have you called it's, Ghostbusters it's, or anything? Yeah, I, I it's uh, I feel like it's been quite a big weekend. Um, I took my son to go see Ghostbusters on a whim. Um, it was sort of like it was just going to be me and my eldest child for the day. I thought, what can we do? I was like, ah, he might like Ghostbusters. Because uh, it might have just been a little bit... Because this one looked slightly more darker than the last one. A little bit yeah. more scary. And yeah, I know that film's received a lot of flack online. Um, but by the end of it, my son was absolutely buzzing. He was like, that was 10 out of 10. That film rocked. And I was like, brilliant. I'm glad you liked it. That was great. Um, but it was just whenever like an old Ghostbusters showed up, he was like, "Who, who are they?" Yeah. And I was like, that, "That's yeah, one of the guys." That, yeah, that's one of the guys for like that first movie. You've seen the first movie. And I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." And then it was like Bill Murray shows up. He's like, "He looks like Joe Biden." Like what? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, uh, what? That's, that's quite an intense pool, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah. And I was like. Damn it! I need to limit this boy's time on YouTube, um, <laughs> just to suddenly say, "Hi, that that's not Bill Murray, that's Joe." And he's like, uh, "Okay," but you love Slimer. Um, I I like some of the additions to the cast. Like, yeah, to me, it's maybe like a, a seven out of ten film. I know a lot of people rating it lower, but 
the fact that they had Patton Oswald in it and Kumail uh, Nanj- Nanjiani, I, yeah, I both a, like. Yeah, the guy from Chalk and Valley, isn't it? Is yeah, it? exactly. Uh, so both of them were in it, and I love both of those guys. So like, they were just like major pluses. Uh, James Acaster is in there yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, I love James um, Acaster. I saw he was in the cast list. I was like, really? I, I don't know who he is, um, but I know like he's he's. He must be a comedian, and he's on tour at the moment. Um, but that's all I know about him, I think. Oh, he's brilliant, man. He's got a really good podcast that he does with Ed Gamble. Yeah, is this like really off good. the menu or something? Yeah, it's, it's a great podcast. I, I've, I've never listened to it, but he, he was in it, and he, he, he done fine. There was nothing wrong with him. Uh, but no, some of the variety and ghosts were pretty cool. There's one that was just this destructive red spirit. That would kind of jump from object to object. So when it would fly to something, then it would just like a toaster would start going mental, and then it would jump from the toaster to the Hoover, and the Hoover would run out of the room. And it would just kind of like all those little random elements that were great comedic moments. Um, but no, it's cool. It was it's another Ghostbusters movie. Paul Rudd's brilliant. Uh, McKenna Grace is great. Carrie Coon is, that the, is the, the mom. Is that the, is that the younger girl, McKenna? Yeah, she's, Phoebe. Yeah. She, she, Phoebe, she was brilliant in it. I, I really, her performance in Afterlife is one of, is probably my favorite. I think, and I, I, I really want to see the new one, but mm-hmm. I need to go and see June. It's, I, I would definitely recommend it. Like, I, I would just feel like the whole internet reaction seems far too. I would just seem to be punching down on it, but yeah, I, I, I thought that's if it's just the case that my kid reacted so positively to it, it increased my viewing experience because I, I it was I was almost giddy about how much he was enjoying this movie. I was like, this is great. Normally, it takes like Godzilla to be like smacking Kong in the face for my son to get really excited. So the fact that he loses his mind over like the third act of Ghostbusters is like brilliant. This is amazing. Like. This is the intended the intended audience, and they're losing their shit. So, definitely seems to be like a yeah. It definitely seems to be an overlooked aspect of going to like I went to see a couple of films last year with Sunny, and I on reflection were like they weren't that good actually. But mm-hmm. going with Sunny and his experience, um, totally changes your perception. So obviously, um, obviously I, went, I took him to see the uh, Spider Man, which was great, and I took him to see. Mm-hmm. Um, Mutant Mayhem, which was great, but then yeah, we went to yeah. also went to see it. We also went to see um, Wakanda Forever and Ant Man, Quantum mm-hmm. Mania, and yeah. he thought those were as good, if not better. Particularly Black Panther, uh, right, Black okay. Panther, uh, Wakanda Forever is like Sonny's favorite movie, and mm-hmm. uh, it's okay. It's an okay film, but his uh, his adoration and love for that movie makes it like a like a total knockout of the ballpark movie, you know. So, yeah, yeah, that's it. It's it's. There's things where like that, and it's like, well, brilliant. That's I'm so glad that like our children aren't like paying attention to oh, what are they saying online about it. Mm-hmm. No, so I was gonna I, I was gonna go see the new Kong movie, but people are saying the plot's paper thin. Like children are not doing like, they're going to the pictures and they're just taking it in for what it is. Yeah. And then they're just yeah, telling they're not, they're, exactly they're not... their thought. Aye. They're not preparing a podcast about it, are they? They're just like, yeah. Aye. I was like, do you want to go see uh, Kong and Godzilla: New Empire? What's its score on Rotten Tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what's, what's what's the Letterbox reaction? Yeah. <laughs> what what what's Metacritic saying about that? <laughs> Shut up, and get uh, in the car. That's yeah, that's a cool one. I'm trying to go yeah, this week. I uh, I read a comic for the first time in ages. I read um. Nice. Like I, I'm WrestleMania after this time of year, so mm-hmm. I, I, re- but I didn't realize until the other day that Jim Cornette's got a comic. So oh, I, um, I never knew that. It's called Behind the Curtain, and it's actually like I, I downloaded it. I got myself a Kindle account, and I downloaded it thinking this is going to be hilarious because I, some, I, I, not often, we're just talking about like slagging kids off from being on like YouTube and stuff like that. But like mm-hmm. I watch, I don't watch his entire podcast. But I watch like five minute reactions to things. You know, sometimes it'll pop up on Facebook, like Jim Cornette yeah. on the Young Bucks or Jim Cornette on a uh, Lucha Underground or just something random. And it's just him having a big mad rant. 
about mm. something and if a couple minutes is enough and I'm like, right, that's enough jumping it. But um the behind the curtain is actually him looking at a uh, him looking at kayfabe actually. So for those that don't know what wrestling is, kayfabe is the or for for the folk that don't know wrestling well enough to know what kayfabe is, kayfabe is this idea that um it's the it's trying to maintain the legitimacy of wrestling by keeping what happens behind the curtain, which is the um the area that separates like the wrestlers backstage from the audience, trying to keep what goes on behind there so that like what um what a fan sees is legitimate. You know, so mm-hmm. it's the idea. I know it, it's not it's not as strongly hit, like kept as it used to be. Where um, again, because of like fucking internet, so it's us talking about like what are they planning? What is you know what's mm-hmm. the, you know what's the rock going to do? Oh, and like analyzing like posters and the spelling of words in the background and stuff. Whereas back in the olden days, it was generally like what you got was all you had to run off of. And mm-hmm. like I've read like I've read Bret Hart's autobiography, and he maintained he, he he ruined relationships when he was younger because he maintained kayfabe so his girlfriends genuinely thought he was getting beat up every night and it wasn't he was he was just acting nah. but he, he mm. so his girlfriends were like oh, i can't be with somebody that like risks their lives in the way you do and gets into fights all the time and it was like you know at no point they turn around with it's an act it's predetermined and i'm just doing it for the you know yeah um so um but yeah so but what, what jim Cornette does in the comic is he goes back to a couple of stories he does the andy kaufman story you know the guy the, the comedian got involved yeah of with course Jerry like, ah yeah like jim carrey the man on the yeah. moon and, ah. yeah so he does that he does that story he did one and i forgot the guy's name but a guy in the 60s who wrestled under the name of sputnik generally because um he was he was a bit flamboyant um, in Memphis at the time, and so he and uh, he he fraternized with black people, and in right. Memphis when there was in Memphis of, in the fifties and sixties when there was still segregation and uh, um, did they call it the Black Crow? I can't. I, sh- I should have kept my notes aside, but they um just basically they they kept uh, they kept people uh, se- they separate people based on race, um and right. made black people sit in places and it was absolutely horrific, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. But he was a white he was a white man that fraternized with and this fraternized with his with his black fans like he he not fraternized but he socialized and he he recognized that he was adored by the, the that element of the community in Memphis and mm-hmm. it, rather than rather than ignore it he embraced it and would go and go to like these neighborhoods and drink and uh, and socialize and. He would rest he would tag he would tag team wrestle with other uh he would tag team wrestle with black wrestlers and you know the segregation was so pronounced in those eight days that often you would have like the black person match in the middle of the show yeah. um and just absolutely horrendous and they would make black people sit and they called it the crow's nest you know which was like a segregated area of an arena so that like ah, and, okay. but apparently he was so popular this guy with um that he that like like the black community in Memphis at the time were coming to see him. There was maybe only like 4,000 in, in like a 15, 16,000 capacity stadium. He, he, they only gave like the, the African American community like 4,000 seats. So they were turning them away. So like people were coming mm-hmm. and getting turned away. And then there was like thousands of empty seats in the in the white area. And but yeah. like, because, which is most nonsense. There were like promoters were genuinely giving away well, we're losing thousands of dollars a night because they wouldn't like like they hit their quota. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, but this guy's credited. I'll see if I can get. I'll, I'll, I'll post about later. But this guy was credited as being a major um, a major proponent in ending segregation in the uh, racial segregation and and a, a key part of Memphis's civil rights movement. Um, it was it was Amazing. fascinating to read. I had no idea this guy yeah. existed. And I, I, yeah, I like to Google what was. Sputnik Monroe. Sputnik Monroe. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason he was called Sputnik was because he, um, because of his behavior, his behaviors were seen as so left. And obviously, like in the 50s and 60s, there was this, uh, um, in the 50s and 60s, there was the Cold War going on. So Sputnik mm-hmm. was used, Sputnik was used as an insult to suggest that he was communist because he fraternized right. with black people. He socialized with black people and he, um, and he didn't, he, you know, he he just hung out with people based on who they were and not the color of their skin. 
mm-hmm. and as a result was regarded as a communist. And and you know they they, they labelled him with this they labelled him with this very lazy um, reference to um, the, the the Russian space agency. <laughs> and he just yeah. <laughs> I think it was like a, I think I think it was an old like a, a white old lady at a wrestling show called him a called him a greasy Sputnik or something, and he was just like. I'm taking that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. But um, <laughs> this guy's recognised the rock. He's recognised yeah. in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in America next to Elvis and um, uh, was it Elvis and Stevie Wonder, and then there's and BB King, and then there's him. He's you know his yeah, his wrestling gears here. So yeah, yeah, I was cool. I enjoyed reading that. I was like, and consider it like I am quite uh, I'm quite negative on Jim Cornette. I I don't necessarily enjoy his mm-hmm. stick. I think. Um, um, if for, for you know, I think he'd be quite funny, but he he often he quite lazily slags off new wrestling and mm-hmm. believes that wrestling needs to go back to what it was in like sort of the fifties through to like the eighties before before Hulk Hogan and that kind of yeah. came in. Um, and he always comes back to that, and you're like, well, let it go, man. Like things have changed, times have changed. Um, mm-hmm. So it was really refreshing to see him piece together quite a positive story. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And it's a comic, so <laughs> I could talk about it on the show. So hmm. and WrestleMania is next week, and I'm absolutely buzzing for it. So <laughs> yeah, no, so I've I've seen clips of this week. Like sort of the two big moments coming out of Raw was like the the CM Punk uh, promo with yeah. Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins, and it all seems to be like they were kind of off script in a sense. Like they were all just having jabs, like. Drew McIntyre especially was just there to wind people up, like yeah. sitting cross-legged on the, the announcer's table, shouting the cameraman's like, "You better not be shooting up my kilt, you pair," and yeah. telling people like, "We're PG, brother, stop swearing." And <laughs> um, but I, I love Drew yeah. McIntyre's character now. That whole yeah, uh, uh, he's, he's right, but he's an asshole. So like, what he's everything, everything he says is legitimately like fair enough. But his delivery and his, like, he is just, um, uh, he's um, he's just great. Yeah. Aye, uh, I'm, I'm hoping WrestleMania goes in his favour this year. He's long overdue sort of big title victories in front of an audience this time. Um, then you've got that clip towards the end where it was like Cody uh, fighting backstage and then The Rock shows up and... It got very cinematic when they're fighting in the rain and yeah. the rocks just there acting like I'm the final boss. Who do you think you are? And he just keeps talking about like Mama Rhodes, just keeps bringing up your poor mum watching this, me kicking your ass in the rain. Oh, you're bleeding now. Look, look, mum, look at your son. And I was like, oh my God, yeah. like this is crazy. Um, So yeah, like that. Oh Show is going to do really well. I saw him. Um, I don't. I don't know if it was intentional. And like, obviously, they talk about this quite a lot in wrestling. Um, when a uh, when a um, uh, Sasha Banks Mercedes Monet showed up in AEW, you know, there was a whole yeah. thing in the background that um, the, the episode the episode of that episode of AEW was coming out of Boston, but they'd missed out misspelled Boston with two S's and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. And so that there's folk that are kind of like. Read. I, a, I've seen a lot of stuff this week about them reading into the fact that that fight between The Rock and Cody had a a truck behind them that had that had a CM not CM Punk sorry John Cena and Stone yeah. Cold on it. Mm-hmm. So I, like I think the current the current stuff I'm seeing online is that there's going to be a bit of an Avengers style assemble against the Bloodline at WrestleMania where it's going to be like <laughs> you're going to get you're going to get a uh, is it Jimmy. Uso, who's like at war with the bloodline as well. So yeah, Jimmy's going to come right. out, Seth will come out, and then you'll get CM Punk and Stone Cold as well, and it'll just be this right. tight Titanic like tussle <laughs> at the end. Aye, that'll help. And they'll drag it all the way out to SummerSlam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I'm excited for this. I mean, uh, we'll probably talk about it at some point next week. Yeah, uh, ah, it's but, um, it's definitely. Yeah. After last year's SummerSlam, I gave up with WWE. I felt tired and frustrated with the results. And I haven't watched a, a pay-per-view properly, properly um, 
more or less I was like, right, I'm just going to stick to the big four. And I didn't even bother with SummerSlam. I watched the men's Survivor Series match and then Punk come out at the ends and then start to finish, I watched the Royal Rumble because it's the Royal Rumble. It's the Rumble, you always watch the Rumble. Exactly. Uh, but no, I do love the fact that WrestleMania overtakes a weekend. Like the whole mm. two night thing's brilliant. I always remember like was it the first year where they had like the pirate theme and the show it's live, but it was also torrential rain and they couldn't really start wrestling yet. And it was just footage of Samoa Joe and Michael Cole in ponchos. <laughs> yeah, um, poncho right, yeah. uh, we're going backstage to see what uh, Drew's up to. That's that was just after COVID. that was just as things were getting lifted for COVID, wasn't it? As well, and you were just like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. Like, oh. yeah. <laughs> and it's just those was memes a... of like sad Joe in a poncho <laughs> in the rain. No, it was um, that was a, a weird show. Um, I really enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed Elimination Chamber in Australia. Sorry, my dogs are barking at something. That's fine. Um, That's I, I, I enjoyed enjoy, I enjoyed Elimination Chamber. Um, I'm loving the build up to this WrestleMania. Um, I I get really excited for this. I mean, I was chatting earlier about it. Um, I really like as well that the um, it, it, we had a wee bit of it when we went into London last year. But the whole thing about yeah. like like some of the some of the bigger and smaller indie, independent wrestling companies will set up shop in the area and put on shows. Mm-hmm. So um, Fight TV, I think it's now called Thriller TV, but they'll do it. Yeah, yeah, I've obviously I've heard that. But they do a they do a thing. With a GCW, where it, mm-hmm. you, you maybe you pay thirty quid, and you get yeah. every G, you get every GCW show during WrestleMania weekend, and that's that's a lot of fun. I did that last year and really enjoyed it. Watched mm-hmm. the stuff I wouldn't normally watch. Josh Barnett's Bloodsport, oh, which is yeah. a like that's a great wee pay per view. And then um, mm-hmm. Sheena Baszler's on it this year. She's been she's been an yeah, part of the that. Bloodsport. So mm-hmm. that's good. I mean, I've watched that. It's just basically a wrestling tournament without ropes. So like, I, I, like remember when they, they tried to do Raw Underground with yeah. Shane McMahon? It's like, we're going to hijack the show for an hour. Look, we've got go-go dancers and we don't have ring ropes. It was just him watching GCW and being like, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, and like, let's pretend we're fighting club for an hour. Um, so I, 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 I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the weekend. Obviously, New Japan, I've got a show. Impact, I've got a show. Um, Cultaholic, I've got stuff. Have- uh, yeah, Ring of Honor. Pay-per-view on Friday. Friday. It's Supercard. Um, Supercard of Honor is always good fun as well. We were there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then obviously the NXT there show was, on Saturday. There was definitely a DCW show that's just been announced. I think it was going to be Dan Housen fighting Nick Gage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, that's horrible. That's so horrible. <laughs> uh, well, I, it might, actually, I think it's a tag team match. So I think it's Dan Housen and the partner of his choosing versus Nick Gage and is it Maki Ito? Yeah, so just and I was like two, two insane beefy men. Yeah, like, that ah, that, 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 remember like, like that spot from All In where Moxley had all the skewers jammed in his yeah. scalp. I could see that happening that's to poor right. Dan Housen. That's but, that image on the big screen is still emblazoned into my retina. Like I recorded that, that moment like, and. My son's reaction was priceless. And it was just said something, that pasta. Because I like would just think of dried spaghetti. It does look like dried spaghetti, hand, yeah. Yeah, stuck out. And, and I think yeah. I just, I'm trying to explain it to him. It's like, it's like barbecue skewers. It's like chop, chopsticks. It's like chopsticks. Um, yeah. And I've noticed something. I, I look, because I, I overlook at these things. Like, obviously... We have all in um happening again this year in Wembley. Um, but I'm looking at the next one, like all in 2025. And if you look at the hotels.com website, they're now booking rooms for August, the first week of August. That means in the next two weeks, those hotels for 2025 will soon be available. Are you going to all in next year? Are you going to 2024? I think yeah, I think I might go to 2025. Because when we were leaving, like last August, I was watching everyone around me booking hotels for 2024. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they announced it that night, didn't they? He announced it. Yeah, he announced it very end of the pay per view. And all I saw was a sea of phones on like Premier Inn. And I was like, ah, we're. I saw, we're I think I saw today. No chance. So, sorry to everybody that's like, this is 
nothing to do. Like, we did the comic thing, we did the beer thing. We're and just talking racing. When it's just me and Jeff left on the show, you know what's going to happen. But you see, Tony Khan, baby. Yeah, exactly. Do you see that Tony Khan announced? So Tony Khan, who owns all Elite Wrestling, he also owns Fulham, um, and they've right. they're install they're installing a swimming pool onto the onto the roof of one of the stands in what? Craven Cottage. Um, so okay. Craven Cottage, which is Fulham's football ground, will have a swimming pool. So folk are, I've seen online, folk are like, yeah, that spring stampede. That's what they're doing. They're sorting out, uh, they're sorting out this year's stampede. <laughs> match. That's the only yeah. reason he must be doing it. You know, why would he need a swimming pool at a football ground? Yeah, Unless like, it's to have Matt, Jericho that, get That's a clear it. sign that Matt Hardy's re-signed. <laughs> they're going to drown him in that pool. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's it. I can rest on that. Such, uh, awesome. Sorry, we need to do a podcast called, uh, an infrequent podcast called The Brew Age Outlaws, which is just... Beer and rest. A quarterly podcast. Quarterly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do want to grab you something next week to talk about um, WrestleMania and do our predictions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I'll try and bring it back. So, beer, comics, a sort of game. What other sort of geekery stuff have you done this week? Have you done anything else worth shouting about? Um, still watching Physical 100 because the drip, the drip feeding the episodes still a very uh, watchable show. Um, we watched the Australian horror film Talk to Me that was on Netflix right. that really messed me up I was looking for <laughs> something to chill like just something to chill on Sunday night ah oh, this is only on for 90 minutes and 90 minutes later I was like yeah. how am I going to sleep now Um, but no I feel like I watched a bunch of films I watched Lumdog Millionaire for the first time um, thinking it was, it was like, nah, nah, I, I, I just assumed it was on this poster and it fucking it wasn't, is. so I was raging. Um, it's an old timer, man. It's an old timer, it's amazing. Yeah, it was um, part of award season on film four, so that's why I recorded it because I'm a huge mark for the Oscars as well. Um, so yeah, watch that. It's Man, like we need to talk about that. I, I went to I went to cinema to see Slumdog on opening night because uh, hmm. I don't know. Like the thing that grabbed me, I thought that the the trailer was incredible, and for whatever reason, used uh, the sun always shines on TV by Aha as like All right. the main, which is one of my favorite songs ever. Anyway, so I was just like, oh my god, like this is going to be epic. And then mm-hmm. for whatever reason, they didn't feature that song in the movie, which is a minor complaint because okay. it's. <laughs> it's such an incredible it's such an incredible film about mm-hmm. fate and about I was obsessed with that movie for about a good year and a bit. I even went and bought yeah. a book that it was based on. Like it's so uh, good. Like, but it was always one of those ones I was meaning to get to. And I was like I occasionally just go through my TV, scan it, whatever film four showing for like two weeks and then record like just record like six or seven films and then when I find out my TiVo box is almost full, I then quickly watch six or seven films to get through <laughs> it. Um, but it's a banger. Though. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old timer, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a really, like a really good story. Um, it won the road with like Ifran Khan in it as well. Um, yeah. And then when it hit to the credits, and that that Jai Ho song came on, it's like, oh, I remember this now. It's a good song until it got a uh, obviously got stolen and or sampled or used by that the girl from the Pussycat Dolls and uh, it, it obviously mm. blew up. But I mean, it was it was a tune before that. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. I like that wee scene. Um, that's just, just a great movie. Really, really mm-hmm. enjoyed it. Um, obviously, it's heartbreaking but, at moments and it's saying that it's uh, it was um, some, some decent trailers came out. Yeah, um, a new alien trailer? movie. Yes. What Aye. did you think of the trailer? Romulus. It was quite an aggressive trailer. Like it showed you a lot of very angry sort of face huggers on the loose. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, like it, I don't know. It, 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 maybe the lot like Alien Covenant and Prometheus were maybe more thriller than horror. This one kind of seems like a jump scare horror. Going back into the alien territory, isn't it? Yeah, which I I, I welcome that. That actually sounds like a yeah. like a, a refreshing idea. 
Um, because when is it? Oh, we're making alien Rom- like Romulus, and like, do we, yeah. need one? do we need another? But that trailer kind of proves, like, okay, I'll watch another. Yeah, totally. Um, what was the other trailer that it, it's escaped me? There was another banging trailer uh, this week. Uh, Beetlejuice. Yeah. It's Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. And that definitely looks like a Beetlejuice movie. Yeah. Uh, You've got that, that is... Ryder. Um, Michael Kath- Keaton, I was a... Yeah, aye, Michael Keaton. Catherine o- is it O'Hara. Yeah. Aye. And of course, like of course, like this, like uh, Jenna Ortega, like that makes far too much sense. The cast are yeah. in this movie, right? The fact that is that right? How do you bridge that gap between your audience? Right, you have all the people that are familiar with Beetlejuice that loved it. The original one, they're ready to come back. But what about like all the new kids? How you got to get them in? Right, we'll, we'll get Wednesday Adams in our movie. Is it right that just yeah. bridge the gap? Yeah. Um, that in order to succeed, it's going to have to grab that younger. I think that's which is what the original mm-hmm. Beetlejuice didn't do. You know, the, the original Beetlejuice did that, and of its time, it they yeah. created a, a wee generation of goths. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like the Tim, you know, it was the start of the Tim Burton, the Tim Burton mm-hmm. like cult, wasn't it? Like that, and then no, it was scissor hands of Batman. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and then you've got like. Uh, what do we do about that problematic dad? Oh, yeah, we'll open on the funeral scene. Perfect. Yes, well played. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Uh, I saw, like, I don't know if it was this week, but the, they, they, they brought out another trailer for The Fall Guy, which I think I'm so I'm buzzing for. Mm, um, it does look like a really fun film, especially after finding out it's the guy that from the director of Billet Train. Yeah, which, like, was an, oh. which was a banger. So Yes. And then you've got like the the charismatic chemistry between Emily Blunt and Ryan Gosling's like, like ah, Ryan, Ryan Gosling he, like, I, I really they hope they get him doing. I really hope they get like him because obviously I think they're they're leaning heavily into like the soundtrack and so obviously the first trailer used uh, um uh, Tyler, maybe? You Give Love a Bad Name by Bon Jovi and then ah, the new right, one right. they used um you're saying uh, Jenna Ortega is perfect for the role, yeah, I totally yeah, definitely. That. But they were, um, a uh, no, they uh, uh, they used a uh, you give love a bad name, and then they gave a mm-hmm. uh, uh, which was amazing. And then they had um, um, the new trailer used uh, a journey one, I think it was the other one, uh, I can't remember what it was. I, yeah, I'm not sure, I think it was a uh, the um, anyway, you want it, that's that one, yeah, 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 yeah. all right, we're good, yeah. Really good. Um, I really hope they get Ryan Reynolds to sing the theme because that's what the original uh, Fall Guy TV program did. It was, uh, oh, right. what's his name? Uh, Lee, Lee Majors. Sung, right, okay. Wrote the theme tune and sung the theme tune. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, that would be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, good trailers. Excited for the movie. You're going to see as Kong comes out tomorrow, doesn't it? Kong and Godzilla comes out tomorrow? Yes, I um as I said, my, my kids are buzzing to see it. So I think it'll probably be like a Saturday matinee will probably be the first chance that we get. Um, but I've not looked at like the the reviews or the Rotten Tomatoes, but I have gotten the the brief opinions of the the human storyline, the human elements to the movie is paper thin. It's mostly just monsters fighting each other. And I'm like, yeah, that that sounds good to me. Uh, I and I've, I've seen that one shot in the trailer where, because the villain's like a big orangutan, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and there's, I think it gets it gets smacked in the face, and all you see is a giant tooth wiping out a car and getting embedded in the pavement. I'm like, that's that's a bit funny, actually. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think the, it'll be. The, I think it'll be fine. It was the same <laughs> as there. I do think that. Um, from what I've read and what I've seen, and I'm trying. I haven't read anything in a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, because I don't want it to be ruined for me. Mm-hmm. So I'm probably going to. Say it. But um, I do think there's a bigger bad that's not the giant orangutan. I uh, I looked at a poster and it spoiled it. It was like, oh, yeah, okay, like, one of these ones, yeah. like, yeah, bugger. Because obviously, with the spoilers for the film that came out, but when Godzilla versus Kong, obviously the 
they they hid they hid the fact or they tried to hide the fact for a while that Mecha Godzilla was the big bad. Yeah, um, I think it wasn't was until like they released like the toy range and then all yeah. the spoilers were out. That was great. It was yeah. a really good. Uh, in my opinion, Mecha Godzilla was like one of my faves. Anyway, it was, mm. I thought I was I was really impressed with how they modernized the idea of like a mechanical Mecha Godzilla, a yeah. mechanical Godzilla. Right? So that was cool. Uh, um, I was right, I was really going to find out this weekend. I was a wee bit. I was a wee bit. Um, uh, I was a wee bit annoyed that one of my favorite scenes in a uh, Radio Player One, and it's one of the bits that they took out of the book, which I was actually really glad about, was when a mm-hmm. uh, Mecha Godzilla shows up, and I was in mm. uh, and I I hoped that they would use that kind of that kind of design for the Mecha Godzilla in Godzilla versus Kong, but they didn't. It was fine. It was actually a really cool. Yeah. Very. I, I, a, a suitable modernization type of thing. But, the nanotech kind of like vibe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the director's already said that you can't just make two films nowadays. Like, if you're doing something that's Godzilla and Kong, and now Godzilla and Kong 2, it has to be a trilogy. Yeah. Like, mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's we'll, fine. Let you, we'll let you away with it. I, I, I really like the MonsterVerse. I think we've talked about it on the show before, but I think the MonsterVerse mm-hmm. is consi- like considering everybody is trying to come up with a universe now and often fail unless you're the MCU. But somehow mm-hmm. this uh, Godzilla franchise is kind of snuck in the back door and is doing really well. Exactly, yeah. And it's, it's probably like a more financially viable franchise in the sense that you don't have to pay for big Hollywood actors. Like You're just paying for the CGI lizard and monkey. You're you're not having to pump you're not having to pump them out. So mm-hmm. like obviously probably that's where MC the MCU kind of crumbled a wee bit and they're like shit, we need four movies and three TV series a year. Yeah. We're actually, I, we're, I mean, we're okay, the two. They've gotten one TV series out of this. And to be honest, I haven't watched Monarch yet, but I've heard like it's all right, like in the sense that it starts off okay, but supposedly the final episode's amazing like an amazing possibly feature length film. With Kurt yeah. Russell in it, and like, didn't he sleep on it? I should really check it out. I've watched, I've watched the first episode of Monarch, and it was okay. It was more, it reminded me more of the first Godzilla movie, where it was a lot of like folk talking and then things happening in the background. Right. You know that okay. kind of. Um, yeah, I, I, I it was, it was probably a budget thing. You know, you, uh, know, you can't have Godzilla all the time. It, it was clever back then, in the sense where it's like. Oh, here comes the big monster fight, and then it cuts to like a TV in someone's apartment showing you the fight as people start yeah. talking. Like, wait a second, I wanted to see him fight that thing. <laughs> it just cuts yeah. away. No, it's kind of it was kind of like that. That's thing. I yeah. um before we go, I watched it and I would recommend it to anyone that hasn't. We talked about it very briefly, um, because I watched the first episode just before we came on last week, and I rewatched mm-hmm. it again last Friday with Sunny. It's the first two episodes of um. And I've not seen the new ones this week yet. The first two episodes of X Men '97 are amazing. Oh, okay, you're right. I would totally recommend it. To, mm-hmm. uh, a direct continuation from the 1992 series that came, obviously, right. from um, and it's just great. So it's a it's a direct sequel set in 1997. So they're playing ah, around yeah, that's with the, where te- the title comes from. Yeah, but playing around with the technology, um, slightly more adult. Um, I'm loving the the backlash it's getting from certain corners of the internet where like it's too mm-hmm. woke, which is amazing because like that's the whole point of the X Men. You know, it was mm-hmm. um, it it was originally conceived as a a direct response and a and a narrative and a, a discussion on the civil rights movement. So the, 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 right, even consider okay. that the X Men the X Men as an idea could be too woke or too too um left or. Or to, mm-hmm. it's just hilarious as a basic concept that that tickles me because folk are complaining that um folk are complaining that they made morph um they they turn they, they've morph who was in the original cartoon a bit of a snidey guy he was just like a bit of a sneery snidey dude whereas now he's yeah. like his 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 default form is more sort of asexual and and. It, it, I think thematically makes sense because he's he's more of a black canvas, and that you know when he's in his when he's in his default like body, he 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 is. There's not a lot going on, you know. His face is totally clear and white, like a eh, like 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 a blank sheet of paper. Um, yeah. His whole power is that he can he morphs into everyone else. Um, 
playing around with the idea, like they, they nerfed Storm quite early on, um, right. which I think is quite interesting because uh, Storm, after Professor X, Storm was this sort of all-powerful character that was just a bit like, you know, she could do everything and that was quite annoying. Ah. And, and as a result, I don't think they ever got her right in any of the movies because it, she was quite a, her powers are quite difficult to depict and they spend a lot of time like limiting her ability to do her thing because she's too good. Um, yeah. So they tackle that quite early on in the comic, and just um, just continue things like um, continue things like the the animosity of Magneto being not necessarily a clean cut baddie, you know, more of an yeah. anti-hero. Um, they play around with that. They play around with the fact that um, they flesh out um, um, Cyclops massively and make him, you know, he's he's trying to lead the X Men while at the same time dealing with the fact that um, Professor X isn't around. So they're dealing with the fact that he's you know he's lost his he's lost his like um, adoptive father figure, and he's mm-hmm. trying to hold his family together. And they play around with that quite a lot. Um, what's her um, Jean Grey's pregnant? So obviously her pregnancy is playing around with her powers and stuff like that as well. And it's just it's yeah. just a really really cool, it's a really cool show. Very clever, it's, um, animated in the style of the old nineties cartoon, which is ah, really no, good. That's that's clever. It's definitely a, it's got an audience there. Uh, yeah. Is it all out at once, or is it? Are they making uh, episodic? They're doing two episodes a week. So the first two. Okay. So that like, we're only on episode four, which came mm-hmm. out yesterday. Right, that time of recording. So we're only got four episodes. Um, kept the original theme tune. Have yes. beefed it up a wee bit, but that that um that uh, that original piece of music with the the really cool intro where you get like the you, it's every character doing um. Doing they're like doing a wee bit of their power as like their name comes above their head. Um, they did a really cool thing where like I thought it was quite clever. The, the, the hide the fact that Professor X isn't in it. They had him, um, but that's there's that's a main plot point. They had a Professor X in the first episode's intro, and then replaced him with Magneto in the second issue. So uh-huh. I'm hoping that I'm hoping that they're going to play around with that a wee bit. As the series yeah. goes on, as as characters come and go, so I haven't seen episode yeah. three yet. Storm's not in it, so I'm wondering if okay. they'll take her out. Of the, I wonder if they'll take her out of the intros. Ah, it's just cool. it's quite a cool sequence. Anyway, I'm going to go and do that. I'm going to go watch that now, so I'll be able to tell you all about happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that us? You all quite you quite sure? I think so. Yeah, you're, you're doing the you're doing the you're doing the toilet shuffle. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like I've listened to Jeff. I'm taking it in, but man, those two beers have hit me. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, so we're um, yeah. I hope like, everyone has a lovely week, and we'll catch you all next mm-hmm. week. Please like, share, and subscribe because we're on everything now, and it's amazing. Um, and yeah, catch us all there. Cheers to take it easy. Thanks, Peace.